thankful, Lord, that we can gather together again as we study through the book, Disciples, Principles of Faith. You can see it behind me on my shoulder here. And if you don't have a copy of it, you can go to Discipleship Empowerment. That's one of our websites, and you can just download it for free, okay? And so we're going to be working our way through that. Glad that you've joined us, people from around the world. I even saw Angel from India, that you were there too, and bless you, and others from different parts of the world. We are just so grateful from Pakistan. I mean, the list just goes on and on that you're joining us and that there's a hunger in discipleship. And though, and also those who are locally nearby, we're glad that you're here too. I see your little thoughts, your little thumbs up, your little happy faces, your emojos or whatever they're called. We're grateful for those too. But thank you for joining us as we decide, as we study the disciples' principles of faith. And we're on a journey of getting more into the Word and letting the Word get into us. And uh, we're going to be going through this whole idea of systematic theology. We're going to be uh, starting to study today the teaching on the Bible, and we will be working our way through everything from teaching on God to Jesus Christ to the Holy Spirit concerning man and woman, other things like that as the Lord allows us, and we'll be working our way through these 12 major uh, doctrines of the Bible that we need to understand and get a little bit more deep uh, depth in them that will help us in our Christian walk and what we believe. And so I thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. James Paul Humphreys, and we're glad to be with you on this sunny day from Manitoba, from Marshan, Manitoba. I also want to just quickly share with you that if you're interested in and in getting involved and wanting some copies, we have a new, and it's going to look backwards to you, but we're going to have, we have a new little booklet called Called to Follow Discipleship Lifestyle. It's come out, and of course, the, the teaching side of it and the coloring book side, this is all about discipleship, discipling people. You know, it's something that you could sit down. You got a new believer or a new Christian in your life that you could sit down, a young person, a, a, someone, a child, whatever. We have this new booklet, and these came to our house yesterday, and I'm told these should come in the next few days. And they go through uh, 12 key principles of what people need to know about discipleship. And so pray about this ministry. There is going to be, well, we'll have 10,000 copies. And when we run out of that, we'll get try to get 10,000 more. <laughs> and we're just believing that God's going to use it. So if you're interested in this and you happen to be uh, close by, come over to our office in Steinbach. If not, uh, message us and we'll try to figure out a way to get some copies into your hand. So this kind of one runs in relationship you know, I've been doing discipleship training now for about 26 years. And one of the hardest things was to try to get all of this information that I had gathered over all the years and to try to get it down into a, just a thin little booklet where you would have the key principles of what it means to be a disciple. And so we're looking forward that this has been completed. It's just, as I say, it's coming we got the coloring book, so if you need to color already, we got them. <laughs> and, uh, but soon you can use this. And I think it's a great way to sit down with other people and do evangelism, the, to, to, to sit down with people and say, hey, well, let's just talk about some of these key things about Christ and what he'd want us to have in our lives and how we should walk with him. And so they're good for everybody. And it's a good teaching point, a good place to start. Well, today, we are going to start our journey on the teaching of the Bible. Uh, there's going to be 10, uh, probably, uh, teaching videos on this, 10 or 11. And so, we're going to do a little piece each day and trust that the Lord will help us to understand. So, as we begin this journey of teaching on the Bible, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you that we can learn from your word, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would be direct and guide and and uh, take that which is uh, needs to be applied to our hearts and apply it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The key verse to this particular chapter is found in Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. It says, And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. That's the foundation scripture to this chapter, that all scriptures, all scriptures are there to give us wisdom, to bring salvation to encourage us, to build us up, to correct us, and to train us in God's righteousness. Amen. And to equip us for every good work. And so this is the basis. You know, as we keep saying, get into the word and let the word get into you. Because as you do, it does. It fulfills Second Timothy 3, 15 to 17. You might not like all the parts of it of how the word can do these things, because the word is going to be profitable to you. And it's going to teach you. But it's also going to reprove you and correct you, and because it's preparing you to walk a life of righteousness, and that the man and woman of God may be adequate, that we'll have enough that we need for our journey here, and it's going to equip us for every good work. So that's the foundation stone that we have as we start off concerning the doctrine of the Bible or the teaching on the Bible. Now, many may know some of this information, but that's kind of a refresher for you. And uh, uh, we start off by looking at the Bible. As you know, we have a a Bible that's given to us uh, by God, handed down through uh, various people. It has 66 books in it. 39 of them are the Old Testament, or what we would call the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, 27 are the Greek New Scriptures. And so you put the the 39 and the 27 together, you've got 66 books throughout the Bible. And this, uh, also known as the New Testament and Old Testament, it was God, through people, through the wisdom of God, put these uh, books down in writing. There was at least 40 people that were involved, and they were canonized. Canonized means that they were accepted by the word as the word of God around 300 A.D. So about 300 years after the death of Christ, uh, we have these these written books that are that are inspired by God, put together into what is known as the Bible. And we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I want to talk about that for a minute. We, we, sometimes we quickly say things like Old Testament and New Testament. But do we actually really hear what we're saying? That's the whole thing. Because when we say the Old Testament or we say, you know, uh, the Hebrew Scriptures, the idea of testament, you know, the will and testament or the will and testimony of God Almighty. So we have the testimony of God in the Hebrew Scriptures, and we have the testimony of God in the Greek Scriptures. The Hebrew Scriptures were were given to the people of Israel. The Greek scripture, Scriptures were given to all the known world. And the Bible itself is given to all the known world. And it's interesting, but you can also call the Old and New Testament Uh, Also, you can call them the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Now, if you understand, Abraham was given a covenant, an everlasting covenant. There's a covenant is agreement that is made between God and man. So we people want to know, always are asking, well, what's the will of God? What's the promises of God? What's the covenant of God? Well, it's right here. He's wrote it down. He signed, sealed it (laughs) under the blood of Jesus Christ. And he has empowered it by the Holy Spirit. 
so that we can walk in the old covenant. We can accept and realize that the old covenant or the old testimony of God applies to us. And we can also receive the new covenant, which was given to us by Jesus Christ through the good news, through the gospel. And and these are, by, it's, a, it's a binding contract. Isn't that an amazing thought? I don't think we ever get this, where that this is a testimony. You know, some of you have wills and testimony. I don't know if you know it's your, if you have a last will and testimony. It's a binding contract. You're supposed to do, after the person dies, you're supposed to do what that will tells you. It's a contract, and it's witnessed by people. This is a contract, and is witnessed by people. And those people wrote out God's contract. <laughs> you know, it was signed and sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so it's not just a book. It's a contract. It's an agreement. It's a testimony. It's a covenant. You know, it's more than something we just lug back and forth to church or something we keep in the back seat of our car or, you know, lay around the house and only open it on Sunday. Can you imagine if you were to open up this today, every day and say, I want to see what the contract of God that I've entered into through Jesus Christ has to say to me. Because when you look at it as a contract, as a covenant, that means the promises in here, the precious promises of God are for you. But so often we just kind of carry this book around under our arm, figuring, well, that, you know, we got to look at it a little bit here and there. No, we need to be getting into the word, letting the word get into us so that we can understand that we're in an agreement with God Almighty. That's an amazing thought. And it's a binding agreement. That, you know, when you look at, you know, uh, with Abraham, there was the shedding of the blood. God said it was an everlasting agreement with Jesus Christ. It became. That's why he had to shed his blood. Because the moment he shed his blood, it came into a binding agreement between us and him. That's why we often think about the communion as the covenant or as the agreement now made between us. When we partake of the bread and drink of the cup, we're entering into that binding agreement, that covenant that God has put together for us so that we can walk in his presence, that we can walk in his power and in his authority, both physically and spiritually. So the see that, that God has given a, a testimony a Hebrew testimony and a Greek testimony to us, but he's also given us a, a Hebrew covenant and also a Greek covenant that we have can enter in through by the blood of Jesus Christ, which makes it a binding agreement between the parties. That's exciting. So it's a Bible that consists of 66 books, 39 in the Hebrew covenant, and 26 in the Greek covenant. And so we can, and we need to begin to study it. You know, the key as we study theology, part, the key part of theology, remember we said theology is just simply, you know, revealing God or knowing God or the study of God. So here we got people want to say, you want to know God? Read the book. You know, that's the whole problem. A lot of people want to know God through other people or through preachers or through all kinds of other ways. If you want to know God, look at his covenants that he has made with his, with men and women. Look at his testimony. And as you do that, you will begin to get meaning and understanding. Now, unfortunately, there's also words that we don't understand. And so we need to begin to define a few words as we start off looking at the various principles when it comes to the Word of God. And we're going to look at several of them. For instance, we have uh, one of our first ones that we're going to study or look at is called the Word. You know, many people just call this the Word. And we need to understand it's the Word of God, but also to remember that Jesus builds on this in John chapter 1, verse 1 where he talks to, to us about be, at the very beginning. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
And all things were made through him. All things that were created were created through him. And so we see here that um, Jesus relates himself as the living word. We have the, the testimony and covenant of the, the written word. But Jesus then brings it up to the place and says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was and is that living word. And all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that is was made. That was made. You know, and so we, as we see this, as him as the word, you know, Psalm 119 talks about, the whole Psalm 119 is based on the word or the law or the scriptures. And we can see also in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, a very familiar scripture. It says, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. It's the word of God. And it's the word of God that we need to trust. It's the word of God where we can say that in John 14, 6, it's the word of God that is the way. It's the word of God that is the truth. And it's the word of God that is the life. John 14, 6. So then we look at this definition of the word. It has the meaning of expression by speech or by writing. So you can express using words by speech and by writing. There's another one which is a very similar that's used in the Bible. It's called the word of God. So the first one was just the word which we've connected to Jesus Christ. But the second one we need to see is the word of God. God is communicating himself and his will uh, to humanity through the writers and books of the Bible. So we have the word of God. Do we accept it not only as the word that God has given to us and that Jesus Christ has come to walk out on earth, God with us, Emmanuel, and do we accept that as the word of God? I remember when I first became a Christian, I this book was was so holy to me that I was careful, you know, I wouldn't be eating over it or uh, drinking over it or smoking over it or whatever it was when I first became a Christian because I didn't I didn't want to defile the word of God. You know, it's so bad when you see the Word of God covered with junk and everything else and dust and never being used. It's the Word of God. And the Word of God should be respected because it's a living Word that is there to teach us. It's a living Word to show us His will in our lives. Then we have another one that comes up. Uh, not only is it called the Word or the Word of God, but is also known as the Bible. And the Bible, the word Bible means like Holy Script or Scriptures or the Word of God. Again, it's, it's containing 66 books. But the word, the Bible in the Greek is just Biblia, which just means books. It means that we have an assembly of a whole bunch of books, 66 books, 66 books that are the Word of God. So when I'm reading Hosea, I'm reading the Word of God. When I'm reading Isaiah, I'm reading the Word of God, Malachi, you know, Job, Daniel, Genesis, Exodus, all the way through to the book of Revelation. These, these are part of the Biblica, which is the Bible, which is the Word of God. And the Bible... It's interesting that the Bible has always been thought of as, as the infallible word that was breathed forth by God Almighty himself to the people so that the people would have an understanding. Then there's another word called scriptures. Uh, again, scriptures are just sacred writings. They are the precious word. They have the authority. They are divine and inspired word. They're the revelation of God. And again, so we use this, this often these titles, some of you who are new to the things of God, we use the idea, well, this is the word, or this is the word of God, or this is the Bible, or this is the scriptures, or we can go on and sometimes as we say, this is the covenants of God. The word covenant means agreement, 
a contract, a treaty, a promise, a pledge. Can you imagine that? The old and new covenant that we many of you have in your hand right now is an agreement, is a contract, is a treaty, you know, a signed treaty, a promise, and a pledge. That's what it is when you say, can you imagine if you could write all those words on the front of your Bible and say, this Bible is the old and new covenant. It's an agreement, it's a contract, it's a treaty, it's a promise, and it's a pledge. Boy, that would be a neat cover to have when people walk around and say, wow, what, what is your Bible? It seems to be so much different than my Bible. No, we're just calling really what it is. And that's what it is. And it's given to us. It's an agreement that is between God and man. It's a covenant. Some covenants are for a period of time and some covenants are everlasting. And that's why we said, you know, the communion account. Paul says this is a covenant now made between us. You know, and the reason we take communion is to remind us of the covenants of God. The word of God. The, the the word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Then there is the idea of a testament. We we also can call, sometimes people carry around with them, the New Testament. And, uh, or the pastor will ask, do you have a New Testament? Or people, uh, the Gideons, they give out the New Testament. And we we assume that as soon as we hear that word testament, New Testament, while we're talking about part of the Bible. But again, we forget that the idea of a testament is connected to the word testimony, that here is the testimony of God. If you happen to carry in your purse or in your briefcase or whatever uh, a, a little New Testament, you are carrying about with you the historical evidence of God dwelling with us here on earth, giving us his truth, and he's showing us true events and people how he has been a living God throughout all creation. I just don't think we grasp, that's why I'm spending this extra time this morning, about these words that we have concerning what we call this book. We we use them, but we don't think about what they mean. Yeah, are you hearing what I'm saying? You know, give a thumbs up if you're connected on that one. And then there is also that we are known, this book is known as the revelation of God. Now, a lot of times we talk about the book of Revelation, but we don't understand that the whole Bible is a revelation. It's a revealing. It's it's taking that which was unknown and revealing it to us. You know, Jesus was God's divine revelation to mankind. He revealed the fullness of God. The 66 books that we have here are a revelation of God. That's why, you know, people say, well, I don't always understand certain parts of the Bible. But read it, because as you read it, the Holy Spirit will reveal it and give you the revelation that's in that book. People will say, well, the Old Testament was for back then. I'm a New Testament believer. I'm under the New Covenant. You've missed it. You've missed it because you need to read the Old Testament because the Old Hebrew Scriptures is a foundation stone to the New. And what the Old, Old Testament does or the Hebrew Scriptures helps uh, to reveal and give us understanding concerning the New when you understand the things that are going on in the first uh, the, the first five books of the Bible, you can understand your walk with Jesus Christ better. And so it's important that we understand it's a revelation. It's a revelation from day one of creation until the ends of the earth when we will have a new heaven and a new earth. It's a revelation that the purpose of the Bible is to reveal. That's why when we sit down and, and open it up, we need to be praying. Okay, Lord, I'm opening it up and I'm reading through Isaiah today or wherever it may be. Reveal to me. Reveal by your Holy Spirit. Because why do we keep saying the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit has been sent to us as a teacher. And the teacher is revealing Jesus Christ. The teacher is revealing the Father. And so there is a revelation. 
We also have some other words that are that are connected uh, with the Bible, and they're words that sometimes we don't understand. But we uh, one of them is called infallible or infallibility. We use that word when we come comes to the Bible, which we mean is complete. Again, it's a theological term that describes the facts of the Bible. We believe that the I believe I can't say for you, but as as in the Bible itself is as infallible or the infallibility of the Bible, it means to be that we believe in that trustworthiness. We believe that it's accurate. We believe that it's reliable. We believe that it's perfect. We believe that it's correct. We believe that it's exempt from liability or error. This is what we believe. We believe the Bible is trustworthy and balanced and truthful in all areas. If you don't believe that, and unfortunately there's many Christians in, in the world that pick and choose. They, they, they look at the Bible like a, like a, a buffet, you know, where they go in and uh, they go, sometimes you go to a Chinese restaurant or whatever, and they have this big buffet and why well, I don't like that and I don't eat this and I don't like that. Well, the thing is, it's all there for you to eat and it's all infallible, the word of God. And so that we are not to pick and choose, but it's all there uh, as a living word, as a living covenant for us. It's infallible, you know, and the Bible is like a, a building bricks that when you assemble them together on the foundation of Jesus Christ, they truly, through the power of Holy Spirit, we will see the power and the authority that the word breathes forth to the people of God. Then there is one other word, that Bible word is called inerrancy. It's a word that often means just without error. You know, the original manuscripts were free from error and contradiction. We've got a lot of people in our society nowadays and say, well, the Bible's full of a bunch of errors. And I love to do this. If they say that to me, I hand them the Bible. Here is the Bible. Show me one. Well, I, I know they're there because other people have told me. Well, still show me one. You know, I've been studying it now for 51 or 52 years. And I see the uniqueness and the, the coming together. It's like a puzzle that has a variety of pieces. And when you bring it all together and assemble it all together, it makes a beautiful picture or a beautiful tapestry with threads weaving around and through it. To me, it is without error. And as a disciple, you got to get into this and let this get into you. It's without error. As a disciple, you have to say, this is without error. It's infallible. As a disciple, you're saying it is a covenant. It is the testimony of God Almighty himself. And, and again, we one more word that we're going to look at today is the word authority. This book has all authority. Authority means power, ability, influence. It has the weight. It has the authority over everything on heaven and in earth. That whole idea of authority, we can see, you know, when we go over into Matthew uh, chapter 10, uh, verse 1, where Jesus is now speaking to the disciples. And uh, he tells them, I'm going to give you all authority. He says, and when he had called his disciples, the 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast out those or to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. He gave them that authority. And because why? It was based on the word of God. You know, and, and the authority is there that we need to understand. Even Titus, uh, one of the smallest books in the Bible. You go back first and second Timothy, and then you go back to Titus. You will see in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 15, where he says, Speak these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. The power of the word of God. And we have the authority because why? We're ambassadors. Second Corinthians 5.10 or 5.20 tells us that we're called to be ambassadors. As you're a disciple, 
you're carrying a diplomatic pouch. And in the diplomatic pouch is the word of God. And we need to grasp that and understand it. And so Paul spent a lot of time trying to communicate and others tried to communicate and to get them to understand the importance of the word of God, the importance of sound doctrine. Paul kept saying to Timothy, and we talked about that yesterday, about how many times he used the word, the word doctrine in First and Second Timothy. You know, and and, and uh, Timothy needed to know the importance of the Word of God and how the Word of God will enable him to be a worker who do not need to be ashamed. Second Timothy chapter two verse fifteen. And so we need to get back to studying the Word of God. I believe we're in the situation we're in worldwide because we've got out of the Word of God. We've got out of studying the Word of God. We have someone that lectures us on Sundays on little ports, parts of the Word of God, and I do that. You know, we call it teaching or preaching or whatever. But that's not yet really getting into the Word of God. We need to be like the Berean people that when they heard Paul and others teach that they went and found out was what they were speaking, was it true? You know, because it's the foundation that we need to understand and we need to get in. Because it's interesting that Matthew and also Peter uh, tell us that in the last days, there's going to be false prophets. Again, go over to Matthew chapter 24, verse 11. Let's take a moment just to look at that. Matthew 24, verse 11, where he tells us here, and I just get it for you so that you can hear me read it. He says, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. There's going to be many teachers and false prophets that are going to rise up and they're going to proclaim that they're proclaiming the word of God. And, oh, and the reason is now most of the days, most of us don't carry a Bible with us to church because we don't think it's important because we got it on our phone, I guess. And so that makes it okay. But the thing is, I remember back in the olden days where the pastor would say, turn to this in your Bible. Let's read it together. Let's look at it. Let's make sure that what I'm saying is in context to what is being said there. And in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 17, he says this to us. Um, it says, you therefore, brethren, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you shall fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. He's warning us that we would stand and stand firm on what? The word of God. And the word of God is standing firm on God himself. It is he who we trust in. It is his covenant, his word. When we end today, we're looking at this whole idea, 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 4, which says, Paul tells to Timothy, preach the word, Timothy. Teach it, preach it, whatever you got to do with it, but get it out. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready to talk about it. Be ready to talk to people. How can you share the word if the word is not in us? But if the word is in us, then we can then share it with others, you know. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready to convince, to rebuke, to exhort with all suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Are we in that time right now? Are we in that time right now where people won't endure sound doctrine? You stand up at the front and say, I want to teach you on doctrine today. You know, I say, oh, this is going to be a boring message. No, it's not boring because doctrine is the teaching of the covenant of the truth of the very presence of God in our lives. You know, he says to endure. They won't endure sound doctrine. You know, I still get service as well. If you go 10 minutes over or 15 minutes over, people are already getting up and walking out because they have a restaurant they got to go to or they got something, you know, they got their boat waiting for them in the lake at the, or they got to go to the cabin or they got to go, they got to go. This is the word of God. There's nothing more important than the word of God. There should be nothing uh, that should come between you and the word of God. And if there's something that comes between you and the word of God, fellowshipping in the word of God, that becomes an idol. 
And that's false worship. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, be ready to convince, rebuke with all suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears that will heap up for themselves teachers. It doesn't say they're going to heap up for themselves the word of God. It says they're going to heap up all kinds of teachers. You know, you see it on Facebook, and I'm one of them, you know, another teacher of thousands that are out there. And people, did you hear this teacher? Did you hear that preacher? Did you hear this? Did you hear that? Wouldn't it be nice if we could get to the place? Hey, you want to hear what I read in the Word of God today? You want to hear what the Holy Spirit said to me today? That's what the foundation we are to build on. Not on teachers or anything else. What I'm trying to do is drag you back to the Word of God. Get back, like Paul says, you know, that they, they will be able to heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Second Timothy chapter two or chapter four, verses two and four. This is what he's saying. It's going to happen in the last days. People ask me, are we in the last days? Yeah. Why? Because the word of God shows that we are and that we're that people are fulfilling what the word of god said would be happening we need to learn and obey but not only do we need to learn and obey the word of god but we need to start being willing to give it away to others to start sharing it with others to communicate it and apply it to others the word of god is our life and we do according to what the holy spirit has called us to do with his still small voice. Amen. So today, as we open up this whole idea of the study on the word of God, we need to understand these words. We need to understand this book. You know, it shouldn't be stuck on a shelf. It should be on your coffee table. Maybe it is, should even be in front of your television. That would be a great place to so you could choose, well, I, will I read the word of God today or am I just going to watch another TV program? What am I going to do? What am I going to do with this living word of God? What am I going to do with this book? What am I going to do about the covenants and promises of God? Are you hearing what I'm saying? I know I'm hammering it and being hard on you a little bit. But I'm I'm speaking this back to myself also. It's the word of God that sets the captive free. It's the word of God that heals. It's the word of God that delivers. Everything is by the word of God because it is all authority. It has all power because it has been spoken to us and given to us by God Almighty right from the beginning to the very end of time. That's our word. That's the power of the word. That's the covenant. That's the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look into this and help us not to run away from your word, but help us to run into the depths of your word. And Lord, that it would feed us, it would get to us. And Father, I pray that even people in the local area where we live, when they come out to the mall today or whatever, they will come up to the uh, our little booth there and say, this is what I read in the word of God today. This is how the word of God touched my life today. Oh God, we are to be your preachers and teachers. We are to be your spokespersons. We are to be your ambassadors. Oh God, help us to be that today, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And if this word has encouraged you, share it with somebody else. If it's discouraged, you know, write me, I guess. But that's where we need to get back to. We need to get back to being old-fashioned believers of Christ who walk in the way and the truth and the life of Jesus. Amen. Know that we love you. And we're just hoping to help you to be able to walk a deeper walk for our Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you. And we will get into principle number one tomorrow. Okay. Bye-bye for now.